brother. Turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of John, chapter 9. The book of John, chapter 9. While you're turning in your Bibles, just a little bit of the background of this passage of Scripture. It's one of those that speaks a lot for itself, but we'll just look at a little bit of the background. At the end of John chapter 8, Jesus told the Jews a statement that infuriated them. He announced to them, before Abraham was, I am. Uh, we talked about the phrase, I am, last night briefly. He was saying, I've been around longer than Abraham. I'm more important than Abraham. I'm more powerful than Abraham. And the Jews had set Abraham up on a pedestal on which he never deserved to be set. And so the Jews became upset. They get mad and they take up stones to stone Jesus. And he walks through the midst of them. Now, if I'm walking through a midst of a crowd who wants to stone me, I'm only interested in taking care of me. I don't know about you. I just know about me. But as Jesus is leaving this crowd, as you get to John chapter chapter 9, he walks by some people sitting along the side of the road. And there on the side of the road is a man that has been blind, the Bible says, since his birth. That's a significant phrase. He's been blind since his birth. His disciples say, Lord, is this man blind because of his sin or because of his parents? And Jesus tells them neither. He's blind so that God can get the glory. And then Jesus says, I am the light of the world. It's interesting in the book of John, as you study it, you'll find that the I am's of Christ in John go with the miracles of Christ. In the book of John. In John chapter 6, he says, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 6, he feeds 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. In John chapter 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. In John chapter 11, he raises Lazarus from the dead. And in John chapter 9, he says, I am the light of the world. And in this passage, he gives sight unto the blind. So as we look at this passage of scripture, Jesus stoops down spits on the ground, makes clay out of the spittle, takes the clay and anoints the man's eyes and tells him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And the Bible says that when he washed in the pool of Siloam that he came seeing. What a miracle just took place. Now, if that kind of miracle took place tonight in Newark, Delaware, if your pastor called someone up front and healed him of his blindness since his birth, if it were a real, actual, verifiable miracle that took place right here in this congregation, everybody would be talking about it. It would spread all over the place. The news media would come and interview people. You'd have local and national news. You might have man been born blind day in Newark, Delaware. Your pastor be given the keys of the city and everybody would be excited because a blind man had been given his sight but that's not what happens in this passage of scripture at all the blind man comes back to the people that he's been sitting beside begging for these years and they said what happened to you he said well a man by the name of Jesus came by anointed my eyes with clay told me to wash in the pool of Siloam and now I can see and they said we don't believe you they drug him to the religious leaders of the day. The religious leaders said, what happened? He said, well, a man by the name of Jesus came by, anointed my eyes with clay, told me to wash in the pool of Siloam, and now I can see. And they said, we don't believe you either. And they called for the man's mother and father to verify the fact that he was born blind. We'll pick up the story here in just a moment reading there. But tonight I'm going to ask Christians to do something that I, it's, it's almost antithetical to everything else that I preach. But just for the next 45 minutes, would you just indulge me and take just a few moments and compare yourself and your Christian walk and your Christian life to this blind man. This man that hasn't grown up in church, this man that's only known Jesus for a few hours. And I just wonder how we as God's people stack up to this blind man. Because I'll assure you, if you don't look good compared to the blind man, you certainly do not compare to the one that is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens. But just for the next little while, I know we always preach, and it's right to preach this way, to keep our eyes off of men, but we are given this passage of Scripture and the Word of God for our edification, for application to our Christian lives. So let's just for a little while see how we stack up to the blind man. I'll tell you this, every time I read about him, I get convicted anew. And a lost person tonight, let me ask you this question. Can you know, do you know what the blind man knows in this passage of Scripture? Can you say with the same authority and the same certainty and that he says that he can see that you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? Let's read, please, in John chapter 9. We'll start in verse 19. This is the Jews speaking to the parents of the blind man. They asked them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, that he was born blind. But what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He's of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. 
These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he's of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Isn't that a great verse? Verse 26, Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciples, disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God speaking to Moses as for this fellow. We know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard they cast him out. When, they, when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. I want to preach in a message tonight entitled, it comes from verse 25, One thing I know. One thing I know. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Lord, we thank you for our time in your house. Thank you for the beautiful congregational singing and the wonderful special. Father, we just ask that you continue to bless this service. Lord, as you've already prepared our hearts for the preaching of the Word of God, Father, I pray that you'll now continue to deal with our hearts through the preaching of the Word of God. Father, we ask that lost people will see their need of a Savior tonight and saved people will see their need of a closer walk with you. Father, do what only you can do in this service tonight. And Father, when you do, we promise to give you and you alone all the praise and the honor and the glory because we ask these petitions in the name of your only begotten Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want you to notice, please, that as we get this passage of Scripture, that this truly is an unparalleled miracle. There have been lots of miracles that have gone on in the Word of God. Lots of things that have been done that defy human logic and human explanation. We've already seen lepers cleansed, blind people being given their sight, Daniel safe in, his, in the den of lions, and the, the Hebrew children safe in the fiery furnace, and walls falling down, the sun standing still, waters being parted. We've seen lots of miracles already in the Word of God. We've already even seen blind people given their sight. But at least according to the testimony of the blind man in this passage of Scripture, this particular miracle has never taken place. Notice what he says. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? Apparently, at least according to the blind man's testimony, no one has ever opened the eyes of someone that was born blind. No one has ever been given their sight that never ever had it in the, in the first place. And so this is a first time miracle that we see in this passage of scripture. Not only is it a first time miracle, it's a fulfilling time miracle. You know, the Bible had prophesied that Messiah, when he would come, when he was on the earth, would do four specific physical miracles. Isaiah chapter 35, verses five and six. Then shall the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as in heart and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness, shall waters break out and streams in the desert. The Bible says that when Messiah comes, you'll be able to recognize him because he'll open blind eyes, unstop deaf ears, loosen dumb tongues, and make lame people to walk. Jesus has already cast out a demon, and the Bible says that when the demon left, that the dumb spake. Jesus has already healed a man who could not, speak, who could not hear, and the deaf have heard. In John chapter 5, we find him walking by the pool of Bethesda, and he sees a man lying there. It's been a long time in that case. And he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? And he said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the water. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. And Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man took up his bed and walked. And the same day was the Sabbath. Jesus has already opened the dumb tongue, loosened the dumb tongue, opened the deaf ears, made the lame to walk. And in this passage, we watch him open the eyes of the blind. Any honest interpreter of the Old Testament 
Testament prophecy that reads this passage about Jesus Christ walks away saying this wasn't just Jesus a carpenter's son. This wasn't just Jesus of Nazareth. It's not just Jesus a rabbi. It's Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of the living God. He proves who he is again as if he needed to do so. He proves who he is right here in this passage of scripture. This is an unparalleled miracle. Number two, I want you to notice our unwavering messenger. Christian, I want to look at this blind man for a few moments. I want you to notice a few things about him. First off, he has the same testimony every place he goes. His story is the same no matter who he's talking to. Did you notice that? When he was talking to his friends, he had the same testimony. A man by the name of Jesus opened my eyes, now I can see. When he talked to the religious leaders, he had the same testimony. Unfortunately, a great many Christians, and most likely a great many even in this room, are a whole lot better Christians when you're around religious people as you are when you're with regular people. You have different radio stations that you listen to if your pastor would get in the car. You would have different stories that you would tell, a different vocabulary that you would use. You're a different person in the house of God than you are any place else. That is not what the Christian life is about. The Christian life is to let our light so shine before men so they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. The Christian life is for us to live it every single day, not just depending on who you're around. We have, excuse me for putting it this way, we have way too many part-time Christians already. What we need are some full-time Christians. What we need are some Christians that tell the same story no matter who they're with. Anybody can fake it for a little while. I was out in the Moreno Valley in California, just south of Los Angeles. The pastor took me up, Brother Floyd Dorsey was his name, took me up to some of the projects in Los Angeles. That's a scary place to go if you've never been to one of those. We were in one of the projects just passing out tracts and giving them flyers about the revival and talking to them about the Lord. And we walked up to a group. We could see them about 50 yards away. There was a, a Hispanic gentleman standing there. He had a group of people all standing around him. And the pastor says, I'm not sure. He said, but I believe I met this guy before. He said, he's the biggest drug dealer in this particular project. We walked up anyway. When we got closer to him, let me describe the scene. He was standing there with a cigarette in one hand and a 40 ounce in his other hand. As the people were standing around him, as we got close enough to hear what he was saying, he was cursing and swearing and using all kinds of foul language. We walked up to him, two preachers. We started to talk to him. Do you know what he did? This will probably surprise you. You've heard so many stories about drug dealers. You know what he did? He dropped that cigarette and he put it out. He took that alcohol and he hid it behind his back the entire time we were there. We talked to him for over 10 minutes. You know he used one curse word in those 10 minutes. And you know what he did as soon as it slipped out of his mouth? He said, Reverend, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. Anybody can fake it for a little while on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. What we need are Christians who have the same story every place they go. That the testimony is the same no matter who is around. Notice, please, we see the unwavering messenger. We see, number one, his story. We see, number two, his surety. I love his answer to the, to the religious leaders. He says, whether he be a sinner or not, I know not. In other words, he admits in this passage of Scripture that there's a lot about Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, that he does not know, that he does not understand. He said, listen, I can't get into a discourse about who this man really is. I don't know all about him, but here's one thing I know. I woke up this morning, and when I opened my eyes, I saw nothing. But now I can see. He said, one thing you'll never convince me of is that I still can't see. <laughs> he said, one thing I know beyond anything else. Ask me all the questions you want. Quiz me all you want. Question me all you want. Bring my parents in. Bring my neighbors in. Bring anybody in all you want. Doesn't make any difference. One thing you're not going to shake is that I know when I met this Jesus, he changed me. I'm different from before I met him. He said, one thing I know. You know, Christians know more than anybody else. Say, Brother Harper, are you trying to say Christians are smarter than all the other people in the world? No, no, I've met way too many Christians that I would never say Christians are the smartest people on the planet. But Christians know more than anybody else, don't we? The Christian knows that our sins are forgiven. 
The Christian knows that he's been born again. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. The Christian can know he's secure in his salvation. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that that I've committed unto him against that day. The Christian can know that our Savior will stand on the latter, in the latter day upon the earth. Job 19, 25 and 26. I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. And though after my flesh worms destroy this body and in my flesh will I see God. The Christian can know we'll see our Savior someday, can't we? First we looked at yesterday, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. The Christian sleeps the sweet peace of someone who knows that he's been saved, knows that he's secure, knows he's going to stand in the latter day with the Savior, and knows he's going to be like Him someday, while the lost person tosses and turns in his bed at night wondering is there really a God? Is there really a heaven? Is there really a hell? Understand the Christian knows more than anybody else. The world stands up and confidently affirms certain things all the while wondering if they're really true. But the Christian can say whether he be sinner or no I know not. One thing I know when I met Jesus he changed me forever. Notice his story. Notice his surety. Notice, though, certainly his solitude. When he told his neighbors, they didn't stand with him. When he told the religious leaders, they didn't stand with him. By the way, Christian, how are you stacking up so far? This man's testimony is the same every place he goes, no matter who he talks to. I wonder how most of us stand up when we look at ourselves compared to him in that instance. And now he stands up and says, I'm going to keep standing. I'm going to keep believing what I've learned. I'm going to keep believing it whether anybody stands with me or not. I don't need my friends to stand with me. I don't need my religious leaders to stand with me. I'm just going to stand. He stands in spite of everybody else walking away. Didn't Jesus tell us that? Didn't he say, marvel not if the world hate you, for ye know that it hated me before it hated you? Doesn't, Ty, uh, doesn't Timothy tell us, yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution? We have way too many Christians trying to impress a lost and dying world. We're to be ambassadors to a lost and dying world, not to try to impress them. Notice carefully, please, we see this unwa- unparalleled miracle, this unwavering messenger. I want you to see, number three, please, the unbelieving ministers. These guys are funny, aren't they? In this passage of Scripture, you'll, you'll notice this about me. If there's a passage of Scripture in the Bible that seems like it's sarcastic, I can tell you where it is. I love to read it when people are being sarcastic. There's a lot of back and forth argument here going on, a lot of back and forth sarcasm. We'll see it right here. Verse 26, then said they to him again, what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? Come on, surely if he really changed you, surely if he really did something that's just spectacular, you can explain to us how he did it. Surely you can give us all the ins and the outs. You can tell us exactly what he did. By the way, he could have, they could have gone all over the land of Israel and spit on every square inch of ground and made clay out of all the spittle. They couldn't have opened one person's eyes. It wasn't the clay that did it. It's the Son of God that did it. They said, what did he do thee? How open he thine eyes. Notice they have a desire to understand what's going on. They want to figure it out before they believe it. By the way, don't we have a lot of people in our world trying to figure it out before they believe it? They want to understand everything that happens when they get saved before they get saved. Can I tell you something? I've been saved for 43 years and I'm still amazed at what took place that moment when I trusted Christ as my Savior. I didn't need to understand all about soteriology when I trusted Christ. I just needed to know that I was a lost sinner that needed a Savior and that He loved me enough to die on an old rugged cross and He would save me if I asked. That's what I needed to know then and ever since then I'm ever more amazed at what he did when he saved me. They said, what did he do? How did he do it? The world wants to explain what happens when someone gets saved. And we as Christians have to admit this, don't we? We can't explain it. We'd love to be able to explain it. We can illustrate it. I was talking last night at the back of the church uh, with a man with an amazing testimony. I, I could have just stood there and listened to him all day long. But I was telling him, he was telling me a story. I was telling him part of one. 
several years ago, I was in a church in North Carolina, in Lexington, North Carolina. There was a man there in that town who was the town drunk. Now, you will notice this. Every drunk that every preacher ever describes from the pulpit is exactly the same. All right, This man was, though, the, uh, the typical drunk that you hear in every single illustration. He would take his paychecks on Friday, cash them, and go straight to the bar. He would drink all night Friday night, sometimes staggering home in the wee hours of Saturday morning, other times sleeping it off there at the bar itself and coming home in, in, in the afternoon hours of Saturday. Had a wife and two lovely children, and he was the town drunk. Everybody in that little town of Lexington knew exactly who he was. Everyone in that little town would have known his name if you mentioned it. He staggered home one late afternoon after a particularly rough weekend of drinking. Very little money in his pocket for food for his children and food and money for his children and for his wife. And he stumbled into the front door. There was his wife standing in the entrance, entranceway with two suitcases, one for herself and one for the two children. He looked at her and he said, what are you doing? She said, I'm leaving you. She said, I'm not going to be married to someone like you. I'm not going to be married to a drunk. He said, what can I do? She said, listen, I want you to sign up immediately for AA. He said, I'll do anything. I'll sign up. He immediately agreed to a 12-step program that takes months and sometimes years to accomplish. He went through all 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, all the counseling and all of those things. They gave him the coin. There's a little coin they give you that states that you're a recovering alcoholic. He took that coin. He went to the local bar. He put that coin in the middle of the bar and he announced... Drinks are on me. And they, saw, they all sat around the bar drinking until the wee hours of Saturday morning. He crawled home Saturday afternoon only to find his wife and his children packed again. He said, what are you doing? She said, I'm leaving you. I told you I'm not going to be married to someone who does that. He said, but I signed up for the program. I did what you asked. She said, yes, but look what's happening. Look how you've just walked in the door. She said, I'm leaving. He said, I'll do anything to make you stay. She said, I want you to go to church with me tomorrow. <laughs> what he hadn't noticed in all of his time and all of his busy life, he hadn't noticed that his wife and his two children had begun going to a, a church up the road. The actual name of the church was Fundamental Baptist Tabernacle on Tyro Road in Lexington, North Carolina. His wife had gone there and heard the gospel and trusted Christ as her personal savior. So had both of his lovely children. And she said, I want you to go to church with me tomorrow morning. It was funny that this man who so quickly agreed to a 12-step program that could take months or years had to think about it for a moment or two before he agreed to go to church. But he did. That Sunday morning he came to church. He sat on the ninth row back on the left-hand side, heard a very simple gospel message that Sunday morning. During the invitation, he came forward. Someone opened up their Bible. They knelt with him and showed him how he could know for sure that Jesus was his Savior. There he trusted Christ as his personal Savior. That was over 18 years ago. Do you know from the moment he got up from his knees at that altar until this very day, he's never tasted another drop of alcohol. He's a loving husband. He's a godly father. He was a Sunday school teacher. And now he's a deacon in his local church. I'm here to tell you something. The world will look at that and say, wait a minute, what did he do and how did he do it? And honestly, Christian, we can't explain it, but we just know it's true. And we could go around this room tonight from one corner to the other and some could stand up and give testimony of the very same, uh, very same salvation out of wickedness, out of dreadful sin. You could tell us all about it. You could tell us how you were gloriously saved. By the way, everybody that's saved is gloriously saved. Others of us would have testimonies that said, I was saved out of sin and drunkenness and alcoholism and drugs before I ever tried it at the age of seven. What I'm saying is this, we can't explain it. If we would, if we could, we would. But when God does something miraculous, only God can understand it. And he has changed this man and these men are waiting until they understand before they believe. Lost person, if that's you tonight, please understand salvation is not because you understand it. Salvation is just when you believe it. Notice, please, we saw the unparalleled miracle. It's the first time in a fulfilling time. We saw the unwavering messenger, his story, his surety, and his solitude. Number three, we saw the unbelieving ministers. What did he do? How did he do it? 
Number four, I want you to notice the universal message. And again, you might not read this the way I read this, but I read lots of sarcasm into this next verse. The blind man is going to respond. What did he do and how did he do it? And he says this, he answered them, I have told you already and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? He knows these men are not going to trust Christ. He knows these men are not going to believe. He knows these men have already announced that if you even admit that Jesus is the Christ, they'll remove you from the synagogue. He already knows. But notice there's a couple things about what he says here. Will ye also be his disciples? To me, it seems to me that this young man has already made his decision. He's already decided that he's going to follow the one that opened his eyes, even though he doesn't know all about him. But notice what he says. Will ye also be his disciples? Isn't that the universal message? Isn't that at its very core why Lighthouse Baptist Church even exists? So you can get in front of a lost and dying world all over Newark, all over Newcastle, and say, hey, wait a minute, will you also be his disciples? We're not trying to convert people to follow a man. We're not trying to convert people to follow a system. We're not trying to convert people to follow a denomination. We want to have people be disciples of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Isn't that why every missionary you support, the missionary letters are out there? Isn't that why you support missions all around the world? So that missionaries like my wife's uncle, Brother White, can go to Japan or Dan and, uh, Dan and uh, Heidi and Dan and Terry Gardner, father and son, uh, a father and son team there, can stand in front of the Japanese in Okinawa and tell them, ask them that question, will ye also be his disciples? Isn't that the question? Notice their response to the question. Lost person, I want you to see something here. Their response 2,000 years ago is the exact same response of lost people today. He asked them the question, doesn't he? Will ye also be his disciple? Watch their response, verse 28. Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple. We are Moses' disciples. Isn't that the answer of the world today? When you tell them about Jesus who died on a cross for them, they say, you can go ahead and believe in Jesus. We'll believe in Muhammad. We'll believe in Buddha. We'll believe in Siddhartha Gautama. We'll believe in this person or that person. Unfortunately, though, the group that outweighs all of the other religions that follow a man is, uh, pales in comparison to the group that believes the guy in the mirror is going to take him to heaven. You ask people, if you die today, you know for sure you go to heaven. Well, you know, I try to do the right thing. I try to read the good book. I go to church every now and then. And their answer is always the same. I am going to be good enough to get there. I'm going to find my own way to heaven. Listen, you can't find your way on vacation without a GPS. But you're going to find your way to heaven on your own. You can't trust yourself to never accidentally take a pen home from work. But you're going to be good enough to get to heaven. By the way, let me explain something here. Maybe, uh, you, you realize no matter how good you are, you can't make sin go away. I am down in the very core of my being a West Virginia University Mountaineer fan. I love the Mountaineers. I love to watch them play football. Now, if I got up and I told you, because they lost their last game, they played against the number four ranked Oklahoma Sooners. We gave them a good fight, but we lost the game. So if I got up this evening and announced to this congregation, I want you to know something, I was thrilled with the outcome of the, Saturday, of the game a week ago Saturday with the Mountaineers losing to Oklahoma. You know what you would know? You would know I was lying. You would know I was not telling you the truth. Now, if the next 25 years that you know me, if I told you the truth... Every time I saw you, if I told you the truth, even when it was painful, I didn't exaggerate. I didn't stretch the truth. I didn't tell little white lies. I just was blatantly, totally and completely and utterly honest with you. You know what you could say at the end of those 25 years? You could say, I believe, Brother Harper's an honest man. You could say, Brother Harper will tell you like it is. You can say, you can trust Brother Harper. You know what you could not say about me, though? You could not say, Brother Harper's never told a lie. 25 years of telling the truth, I can't make one lie disappear off my record. It doesn't matter how many good deeds you do. You come short of the glory of God before you were even born. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Therefore is by one man sin entered the world and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. 
People are thinking that if they trust themselves, they'll get to heaven. You can't trust yourself to get there. You can't be good enough to get there. Notice what else they said. Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spake unto this fellow, uh, spake unto Moses, but as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. Not only they're trusting their own, their, uh, not only they're trusting a man to get them to heaven, but they're also trusting religious knowledge to get them to heaven. How many times have we heard that? How many times have you in this room heard that over the years? Well, I just don't believe that there is a heaven and a hell. Can I ask you a question? And I, I, I know this might sound smart, like I don't mean for it to. What makes us think we have to believe it for it to be true? If God says there's a heaven and God says there's a hell, that means there's a heaven and that means there's a hell. Well, I just believe that if I do this, I'm going to make it. I just believe that God's going to weigh my good deeds. I just believe that I've got to work really hard. I just believe. Understand this. If you're trusting religious knowledge that doesn't line up with this book right here, it will never end up with you having eternal life. The fact is, these men say, hey, we know that God spake unto Moses. And God did, in fact, speak unto Moses. We know that God spake unto Moses, but Moses never claimed to be the Son of God. But as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. Just like today, the world is trusting a man and the world is trusting religious knowledge to get them to heaven. But only Jesus Christ and trusting him will ever do it. It is amazing too, isn't it? When it comes to salvation, it's the only area of our life in which we do not understand what a gift is. You think about that. In every other area of our lives, we know what a gift is. Mothers in this room, you know on Mother's Day, early that morning, your children are going to come into your room with a burnt piece of toast, some runny, uh, some runny eggs that aren't cooked all the way through, and some overcooked bacon, and a card they've made with their own two little hands, and a macaroni necklace, and they're going to give you that wonderful gift there on Mother's Day. And you know what you're going to do? You're just going to take it. On Christmas morning, you don't have your children do the chores before they start opening their presents. On your anniversary, husbands, you don't make your wife uh, do all, uh, 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 cook your breakfast or cook your dinner before you give her her anniversary gift. We understand what a gift is in every other area of our life. But when it comes to salvation, we think we have to earn this gift. When it comes to salvation, the free gift isn't free anymore. It requires responses on my part. It requires work on my part. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's a gift given by God and all you have to do like any other gift is just receive it. The universal message. Will you also be his disciples? Their response was the same as the world's response today. We're trusting a man and we're trusting religious knowledge and that will never get you to heaven. Notice carefully please. He's not only did we see the unparalleled miracle, the unwavering messenger and his story, surety and solitude. Not only did we see the unbelieving ministers, what did he do and how did he do it? We saw the universal message, will you also be his disciples and their sad response to that. But I also want you to see that he was unaccepted by men. These men do not embrace this young man. This, he may be an old man, we don't know his age. They do not embrace this blind man. They do not say, well, that's a pretty good argument. I think we'll listen to you. He continues to talk to them and they, they say, we don't know who this fellow is. And he says, well, since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. He gives them what is an outstanding argue, uh, logical argument. If he weren't someone of God, he would not be doing this kind of miracle. And their response is, thou wast altogether born in sins. And dost thou teach us? Who do you think you are? A few hours ago, you're just a blind man begging on the side of the road and you want to question us, the religious hierarchy of the nation of Israel. Notice the way they word that. Thou wast altogether born in sins. They failed to even acknowledge that they also were altogether born in sins. And they cast him out. He's unaccepted by men. They cast him out. Oh, Brother Harper, no big deal. If someone made me leave this church, I'd just go up the road and go to another church. That's not the way it ought to be, but that's the way it does happen in today, in, 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 our, in our day and time. But understand this, that we're not talking about uh, Delaware when we look at this passage of Scripture. We're talking about the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel and the religion of the Jews are one in the same in, as you get to this time in history. When you're removed from the synagogue, you're almost a man without a country. 
His parents, think about this, his parents earlier in the passage when they were asked if their son, if this was their son and if he was born blind and how does he see, they were afraid to answer. Why? Because they said they feared the Jews. Because the Jews had agreed already that if anyone did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Think about this. The first time this man saw his mom's face, she was turning her back on him. The first time he ever looked at his dad, he was walking away, cowering in fear, afraid of the religious leaders. And there he is all alone. Verse 34. They answered and said, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. By the way, Christian, back to you for a moment. Nobody stood with him. Not mom, not dad, not friends, not religious leaders. But he still stood. Let me ask you, how do you stack up to that? He's only known Jesus for a few hours. And he's already willing to believe him, even though it means he's going to be ostracized. I'm here to tell you something. I don't know of a lot of Christians, and I've met quite a few, that could stack up to what the blind man does in this passage of Scripture. There he is alone. Brother Harper, that stuff doesn't happen. I mean, we live in a free country, we live in a free society, that stuff doesn't happen. That kind of persecution doesn't exist. You know, you might think that's true, but in 1995, I got on an airplane, I flew to a town called Ogden, Utah. I was going to preach at, believe it or not, Fundamental Baptist Camp was the name of it, in Ogden, Utah, Ministry of Berean Baptist Church out there. At that time, the pastor of the church was a man by the name of Mark Short. His assistant pastor was a man by the name of David Short. Brother Short, Mark Short, went home to be with the Lord a few years after I was out there. In a, in a tragic accident. I went out there and I preached Sunday morning, Sunday night, and then Monday we loaded up and went to the camp. Now, for those of you that ever preached at camp and those of you that go to camp, it's unusual at this camp because you have the second graders all the way up through the 12th graders in every evening service. And that's hard to preach that way. If you're preaching something the second graders understand, you're preaching so far beneath the 12th graders, they're rolling their eyes and making little comments. And if you preach to the 12th graders, you're preaching over the head of the second graders, not understanding anything that you say. And so they get restless. So it's difficult to preach to that wide a range when you're preaching in a camp setting. On Wednesday night, I preached and gave the invitation. A young boy walked the aisle. He was the church secretary's nephew. Nine years old, walked the aisle, came forward at camp and trusted Christ as his personal Savior. I was excited. Nobody else was excited. Everybody else looked worried. You know what I did? I did the typical Christian thing. I just decided, well, I must be a better Christian than everybody else because there's joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repenteth. And these backslidden Christians can't get excited when somebody gets saved. I must be super duper spiritual, you know. Went to my cabin after the service. I was just sitting there getting things ready for the next day. There was a knock at the door. It was Brother Short, the assistant pastor. He said, hey, we'd like, to, we'd like for you to come down to the office. And I went down to the office with him. When I walked in the office, there was that young boy, nine years old. There was his aunt, the church secretary, Brother Short, and myself. The pastor Short says, we're going to call his parents and tell them what happened tonight. They dialed the phone number. And by the way, if you've ever gotten a phone call on Wednesday night from camp, it's usually not a good thing. It's usually homesick or hospital, one or the other. There's very few things in between. They dialed the number and the church secretary handed the phone to this little nine-year-old boy. I'll never forget how he began the conversation, how he began talking to his parents. It, made, it literally made chills go up and down my spine. Just to hear how simple he said it. He said, Mom and Dad, they were both on the phone. He said, Mom and Dad, I got saved the night. I just loved hearing how sweet that was, how simple that was. I got saved the night. I'll never forget what he said next. He said, hello? 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 Three times. He handed the phone to his aunt and he said this. He said, I think they hung up. When they got home on Saturday, they pulled up in front of the house. There on the front porch, they noticed a pile of things. There on the front porch was all of his clothes. <laughs> there on the front porch were all of his toys. There on the front porch were all of the pictures they'd ever taken of him. With a note from his mom and dad, who were Mormons, by the way, telling him that he could go and live with his aunt and the rest of the Baptists. 
that his parents never wanted to see him again. I wonder how we'd stack up to that. I wonder how I'd respond to that. The truth of the matter is, Christian, you get to the end of verse 34, this isn't that good a story, is it? This isn't that great a miracle. I mean, the miracle itself is great, but if you think about it, before he meets Jesus on the side of the road, he's got friends, he's got family, mom and dad. He goes over to the house for dinner. He can go to the synagogue if he wants to any time. And now that he's met Jesus, he's got his eyesight, but he's lost everything else. Doesn't have any friends. Doesn't have any family. There's nothing. Until you get to verse 35. And Jesus heard that they had cast him out. I love this. And when he had found him. The end of verse 34, he doesn't have any friends. Now he's got a friend that sticketh closer than any brother. And you get to the end of verse 35, uh, 34, he doesn't have any family. No. He's been made the, uh, an heir of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. You get to the end of verse 34, no one's standing with him. You get to the end of verse 35, Jesus is standing with him. Everything changes in verse 35. He was unaccepted by men, but lastly we'll see this. He was, you see, the undeniable Messiah. <laughs> Liberal theologians will claim, literally, that Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. I don't know how you read this passage of Scripture and not come away convinced that Jesus is proclaiming himself to be just that. He says unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Can I remind you of something that you probably already realize? The group of people this man has seen is a pretty small group of people, isn't it? It's just the people on the street corner and the people, the religious leaders that he's talked to and his mom and dad. He's not seen very many people. And Jesus said, listen, you've already seen the Son of God and you are talking to him right now. It is he that talketh with thee. By the way, the, the blind man had no problem understanding what Jesus said. Notice the next verse. And, and, and he said, Lord, I believe and he worshiped him. What became of the blind man? Was he a deacon in the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem? Did he teach a Sunday school class? We don't know. Here's what we do know. We know where he is right now. We know he's kneeling at the same feet, worshiping the same Savior he's worshiping in verse 38. Not just thanking him for eyesight, but thanking him for eternal life. Lost person tonight, he didn't just think Jesus changed him. He knew he did. Can I say this about eternal life? The one thing that we must know for sure is truly the only thing that we can know for sure. Everything else, everything else comes into interpretation and explanations, all those kinds of things in our entire lives. Can't tell you how many people have said over the years, well, what I was so sure about, now I'm beginning to question as I get a little bit older. Understand this, but when it comes to salvation, it's not a hope so thing. It's not a maybe so thing. It's not I've got my fingers crossed kind of thing. It's not if this happens or if that happens or if I'm in the right place or if I go to church the day before I die or if these, I, I have this la the last rites or if I've given enough money or if I've done this. It's not an if thing. It's a no thing. And the blind man says, one thing I know, whereas I was blind, now I see. Can you say tonight, lost person, one thing I know, whereas I was lost, now I'm found. I'm not just hoping I'm going to heaven. I know I am. Not because I'm good. Not because I've done everything right. Not because I've dotted every I and crossed every T. I know because I've trusted his finished work on Calvary. Christian, how about you tonight? How'd you stack up? Just honestly evaluate yourself in comparison to this blind man. And then realize when you, when you come, to, come to the conclusion that you did not stack up well compared to the blind man. None of us do. Remember, he's just a sinner like me and you. I'm not even supposed to compare myself to him. I'm supposed to compare myself to the one that he's worshiping at the end of the passage. And if I look bad compared to the blind man, how do I look compared to the perfect son of God? I wonder, Christian, how'd you stack up tonight? 
Lost person, it's time to stop hoping you're going to heaven. It's time to know for sure. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. No one looking around. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around.